Good evening, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Four Score Speaker Series. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. This is our seventh month offering virtual programming due to COVID. Well, we are all learning so much, and we're much more engaged than we ever have been all across the nation. We appreciate your continued support of the foundation and our, our mission of providing cultural and educational programming while encouraging Lincoln scholarship. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Thomas Brown, professor of history from the University of South Carolina, as he discusses his latest book, Civil War Monuments and the Militarization of America with our very own Lincoln historian, Dr. Christian McWhorter. This book recently received the Tom Watson Brown Book Award of the Society of Civil War Historians. Dr. Brown received his PhD at Harvard University where his dissertation was the last to be supervised by the great Lincoln biographer, David Herbert Donald. As always, we will entertain your questions from the audience tonight. So please go ahead and type those in the Q&A box below and we'll get to as many as possible. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Christian McWhorter and Dr. Thomas Brown. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for tearing yourself away from the news uh, for, for an hour to come uh, listen to us chat. Um, I'm really thrilled tonight uh, to have Dr. Brown here with us, um, I, uh, I think uh, uh, Jay, Jamie mentioned that his book uh, recently won um, uh, the, the Book of the Year Prize from the Society of War Historians, which I think it amply deserved. Um, I'm a bit of a, uh, well, I mean, I ended up working in a museum, so, but I'm a bit of a public uh, monument, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, obsessive myself. Uh, and so having a really thorough uh, study of these monuments, how they came about, and, and his unique take on what they mean um, really intrigued me, and I, and I hope it will you too. Um, before we start, though, uh, Jamie mentioned, um, and I had forgotten this, that you were one of David Donald's, uh, uh, or you were David Donald's last supervised student. Um, little known fact about the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library is Donald gave us uh, a big chunk of his personal library. So if you pull, uh, if you come to the library and pull certain books, uh, it has his, uh, you know, little, uh, what do you call it? His little card on the inside that he has signed. And it's, you know, his personal copy of, you know, Lincoln and his generals or whatever. They're actually all in our collection uh, on the stacks. And I always, I always think that's pretty cool. He had a fantastic library. Every now and then he'd have the graduate students over and and we would just, you know, um, admire it. It was it was a wonderful place to be. Yeah. So it was what like a, a, what a, like a it was like the library of a small college, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I know we so I know we don't have all of them too. We just have like two boxes. So he probably sent them hither and yon. I don't I don't know where they all ended up, but we ended up with a chunk of them. So that's mm -hmm. that's kind of cool. But uh, but anyway, uh, that's that's not what we're here to talk about. So uh, <laughs> so with um, Civil War monuments. Um, and memorials, um, you know, that the, you really do a, a wonderful job in this book of going through um, not only the various different uh, kinds of monuments, that how they changed over time, um, but really doing an excellent job of, of analyzing what they mean um, in terms of the kind of, you know, obviously we're arguing about these things right now, but, but you also bring another context for you really see them having made a a big impact on on kind of the cultural landscape of America in a bunch of different ways. So so why don't we just start um, by talking a little about the the proliferation of these monuments, right? Sure, sure. Yes, I mean it's it's very much a book about a form and its various subforms. And the starting point, as you say, is this proliferation that there are very few public monuments in the United States at the time of the Civil War, which was not a coincidence. Um, and it was not, you know, the result of some kind of youth of the nation or something like that. It was um, a sort of discomfort with the monument as a form and a feeling that it did not fit especially well with the democratic culture of the United States, right? The, the monument was an, an ancient form um, and that had flourished in imperial Rome and it had been a monarchical and imperial instrument for centuries. 
and what public monuments there were in the United States before the Civil War were largely about wrestling with that inheritance and trying to reshape them for the United States. Um, and there were somewhat more for reasons that are unrelated to the Civil War in the years before the war, kind of changes in, in cityscapes and things like that, but not a lot. Um, and then the war comes and um, above all, because of the impact of death in the war, um, but also as, I think as a product of like um, nationhood and thinking of the United States as, as a, a more comparable to the European nations than it had been before. Um, you've got a, a complete explosion of these monuments and the Civil War monument becomes the, the center of gravity for the form. You know, it's like where the, it's how the form matures in the United States. Um, and so that's, that's uh, useful for thinking about the trajectory of the public monument in America. It's useful th for thinking about the trajectory of different ways people thought about the Civil War. Well, and, and, and to cut right to the chase then too with your subtitle. So because it's the Civil War that does this in America, you know, it, it, there's, a, you, there's an element to the Civil War that it's a war that you say it sets the form. So what elements of this form then get set because it's the Civil War that's this kind of er moment for monuments Yeah, well, the, I mean, it's not just that it's a war. I mean, the Revolutionary War was a war too, right? Sure. But um, it was... Um, but there, there comes to be what I call this militarization, right? And yeah. embrace of particular um, memorial forms like equestrian statues, um, triumphal arches, allegorical figures of victory, and so on, um, through which the United States begins to embrace different ideas about kind of social organization. And so like the equestrian statue is a good example of this, right? Mm -hmm. The ideas about leadership change over the course of the, the, the kind of the heyday of the Civil War equestrian statue. And in the early aftermath of the war, uh, my argument is in the 20 years after the war or so, 15, 20 years, you've got a considerable persistence of the democratic culture that, that from which the war emerged, Jacksonian America. Um, and you know, the, the most dramatic example of that is the invention of the Common Soldier Monument. Yeah. Um, as I said, monuments had generally been hey, Julius Caesar, the king, something like that, Marcus Aurelius on a horse. Um, and the United States really introduces the common soldier monument, which is very much a, a parallel to introducing the military cemetery where every individual person is going to get a grave if they can be identified, um, and, um, and Memorial Day and decorating those graves. I mean, those things all run together. And that's a good example of this democratic culture surviving after the war. Um, and I think that is true of early post-war leadership statues too, and, and early post-war victory monuments. In the 1880s, you begin to get a shift in the culture and the war um, begins to take on kind of different meanings that, that sort of intense post-war grief, the highly particularized, you know, um, that, I mean, somebody specific is dead that I knew. That, that kind of grief loosens in the culture um, and the war becomes a vehicle for debating ideas about social order, um, ideas about manhood, ideas about leadership, ideas about society um, through these different kinds of monuments. Okay, going back to the soldier monuments too, give us a sense, because it's really amazing, like of the scope of these monuments, like how, how many monuments, you know, what what kind of proliferation are we talking about here? There are definitely a couple thousand. You know, yeah. I, I um, kind of make a point of not trying to have a you know an exact number. Oh behind, sure, right. I'm going to stand by. But, yeah. But you know, order of magnitude. Um, yeah. We're talking about um, not in battlefield parks. Um, we're talking about a couple thousand. Yeah. I mean, they get, I was, one of my favorite things in there is they get their own magazine, Monumental News, which, right? That, that, well, they cover, Monumental News covered all kinds of monuments. Including, well, I know, but, but it's part yeah. of this whole but, movement, but Civil right? Civil War monuments were a big yeah. part of it. Civil yeah. War monuments were a big part of it. And that's a good example of how the monument as a form matures in the United States, that there's a trade magazine, you know, yeah. Monumental News. And, and it was a staple in, in other kind of trade periodicals. And, it, and, and with the best title ever. Um, and then, and then, yeah, I mean, this, so, so to, to 
to get back to the point you made about, you know, the early Republic versus, you know, the Civil War. So then, as you mentioned, so you get these soldier monuments, but then you get this evolution then of these monuments of of leaders of, of you know, so like I've got your, or I'll, I'll plug your, your book here by showing the cover, but you know, this That's monument right. to Sherman on the cover, which is in New York City, like you, this is a, um, this is a very new thing uh, as far as a kind of public commemoration, right? Well, there, there had been a couple of equestrian statues of Jackson, a couple of equestrian statues right. of Washington. Those were, as I say, these kind of statues where American artists are very self-consciously trying to develop an American take on a traditionally imperial monarchical form, right? Um, and that, that um, kind of democratizing trend continues with the early post-war um, you know, leadership monuments. Mm -hmm. um, but then, as I say, in the 80s and 90s, you get a shift towards um, a different kind of thing where we begin to see uh, much more of a um, the commander reviewing the troops sort yeah. of thing, where yeah. the commander reviewing the troops is like a political metaphor, where, you know, we, the citizen, we stand in as the troops, you know, the viewer of the monument. That's us. Mm -hmm. We're the troops. Um, and we're supposed to, you know, earn the approval of the leader. You know, that's that's a kind of hierarchical vision, much more hierarchical than the kind of vision that was, you know, in some of these early monuments that that are very much about action. They're very much about um, the leader leads from the front. Uh, yeah. Nobody's life is worth more than anybody else's. Um, even, you know, the pre-war statue of George Washington that's in Washington, D.C. is along these lines. Yeah. And several post, you know, Civil War monuments, the early ones are of this kind that kind of demonstrate the leader leading, you know, from the front, you know, he's, he's part of the group. So, um, you've, so you've got these, you know, as I say, democratic ones, a, a good example, the, the greatest of them is not um, an equestrian statue at all. It's a naval statue, um, David Farragut in New York City. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea is, you know, he's on the same ship. Um, famously, you know, Farragut ties himself to the mast, um, at, you know, at um, Mobile. Um, he is, he, um, you know, his, his life is very much on the line with everybody else's, and he's not trying to control anything. He is trying to, you know, ride the waves. He is, he is trying to, um, you know, surf, as it were, steer. Um, and it's a different kind of leadership from trying to control. And that's, and that's French, right? Isn't that, and that monument is Daniel Chester French. Am I right about that? And that was Augustus St. Gaudens. Oh, St. Gaudens. I got them mixed up. I knew it was one of the Lincoln guys. Yes. <laughs> yeah, close. Yeah. And, and that's what gets him the Lincoln one, right? Because he does. Yes. Am I right about Saint, the, yes. the, the Farragut? Okay, I got that right. Absolutely. The Farragut um, Commission put St. Gaudens on the map. He's the hottest, and, you know, he, he all of a sudden, he, he was, you know, relatively little known. That's his first big success. Right. And it's, and it's, it is actually, it's a beautiful monument. I went to New York for, uh, a few years ago and made an effort to go see it. And um, yeah, it's, it's well worth checking out, but um, I, I teased Lincoln there and we'll get to Lincoln, but before I, I want to go back to the, the, I thought you made a really interesting point that you touched on a little bit here, but I want to flesh it out a little more about the early monuments, especially a lot of these monuments you see in these towns that, that highlight the soldier Mm -hmm. how you connect that to these pre-war ideas where the like I, the the ideal american is the agrarian farmer right the, or the individual citizen and so how does the civil war and how do these memorials change that uh, that idea yeah in the in the um in the pre-war period you know that that is the archetypal american citizen is the farmer um you know, a soldier, um, the, the army was generally seen as a place of moral temptation, um, a personal testing to be sure, but not a place that it was going to make you better, right? A place from which you might prove some th certain things, but not a place in which you were going to improve or that improved, you know, the, the citizenry um, in the way that, you know, husbandry, farming um, was seen as kind of improving the citizenry. So like a, a really good example of this is, is Daniel Chester French's Minuteman statue, which I'm sure is familiar to many people. That guy, um, he, he's got a plow in one hand, he's got the gun in the other hand. Um, he is a fully formed man. He is not going to get any better 
um, by participating in the Revolutionary War. And of course, this is a monument that is made after the Civil War in the 1870s. He is not going to get any better. He is he is um, got his virtue with him. The virtue came from the plow, right? Um, and now he's going to exercise it in the war. Um, what you get in the Civil War is the rise of the idea that the army makes you better, um, that it is a school of sorts. Um, and there are monuments that are very much about this. Um, and the prestige of soldiers increases as the prestige of farmers falls. Um, and so the farmer becomes, um, from the yeoman, the farmer becomes the rube, the hayseed, the hick, yeah. um, and the soldier becomes the new prototypical citizen. Um, and as I say, there are monuments that now show the soldier um, in, a, in a different light, um, in, a, in, in the immediate so post-war era, um, the soldier monuments were largely, um, you know, this kind of single figure, um, sentimental um, picket guard sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, later on, he becomes active. He starts fighting, he marching, yeah. and so on. Well, and, and you know, something that, that gets lost that maybe are, you know, some people watching me, like the, in the early Republic, you know, the founders were extremely, you know, you mentioned how the, the army wasn't supposed to do that made you better. Like the, the, they were very suspicious of, you know, Absolutely. one of the things they really didn't want was a standing army. They were very suspicious about this. And so those early monuments, when they did show soldiers or even the, the grave sites of Revolutionary War heroes or whatever, the emphasis was on that these guys, or, you know, and Washington himself, that these guys stopped being soldiers, that they, you know, that the monuments depict them in a way that emphasizes their life outside of the army, as where after the Civil War, it's their experience as soldiers that becomes the celebrated thing, right? Am I oversimplifying? That's, it, it, you know, that's exactly right. I mean, if you ask, uh, you know, Americans, really, from, from you know, 1783, you know, on, uh, right through the Civil War, you know, what was George Washington's greatest moral achievement, they would say, giving up command at the end right. of the war. That's something that nobody did. You know, the Julius Caesars, the Oliver Cromwells, the Napoleons, right. you name it. You know, the George Washington's here, you know, they moved, they, they seized, you know, civil power on the basis of their military power, whereas Washington gives it up and he waits until he's called back. And the early Washington statues largely represent that moment. Yeah. You know, they largely show Washington turning his sword to the American people to signal, you know, we do not go straight from military to civilian um, power in this country. Um, whereas in the Civil War, uh, it, after the Civil War, it's, you know, 20 years after, you begin to get these monuments that, as I was saying, like about the soldier reviewing the troops, you begin to get that direct connection in a way that you hadn't had before even for people who had no political career, you know, people who, Robert E. Lee or somebody, you know, people like that, they become political metaphors. Sherman, the Sherman on Pennsylvania Avenue is mm -hmm. like the quintessential example of that, right? Yeah, and there's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going in so many directions here, there's so many things I want, but yeah, well, and what's interesting about that then is that, you know, and then once they go, once Americans go for that idea, they really go for it, right? You know, these things <laughs> yes. pop up everywhere, you know, right? So Yes, yes, um, yes. Even some small cities build equestrian monuments and yeah. Right. Yeah, some, there's some lavish monuments in quite small towns. And, and towns all over the country have them. I think a lot of people probably don't appreciate how many there are in, especially in Northern states. Um, but that's, that's really where the largest numbers are. There's tons and, in New England. There's tons in Iowa and Michigan. Yes. No. Um, absolutely. And, and they, you know, and this is part to, to bring into the broader context of Civil War memory, too. There, there's in the late 19th century, especially, there's this fascination in America with the war generation, with Civil War soldiers. So they're part and parcel of this broader movement where these, you know, the, the Grand Army of the Republic's getting formed in the North, or the, you know, um, United Confederate Veterans is getting formed in the South, the United Dollars of the Confederacy is is spreading these monuments. Can maybe talk a little, and we uh, and, and before actually I said, please remind the audience too to send in your questions. I see we already have a few. Um, yeah, talk for a little bit about uh, the, the the little bit of different flavor then of, of Confederates as the people who lost the war uh, putting up these monuments, right? How does that influence what they're doing? Sure, um, as I was gonna say, one thing that's true of all sides mm -hmm. is, is just to reinforce what you're saying 
there's little coherent idea of the veteran as a social type, right? And this, the veteran becomes a, a category of citizenship, you know, a social type after the Civil War. And the monument yeah. is really, a, you know, a field for the articulation of that, you know, this idea of the veteran as a social category. Um, so that is, that is true North and South. Of course, the, you know, the Southern Monument's different um, for, you know, in several ways. I mean, they're, they're monuments to the Confederacy and the Confederacy is very different from the Union, right? I mean, it's pro-slavery secession movement. So, you know, I don't lose the fundamental point of what the monument was to. Um, they were, um, you know, they're, they're different in, um, in other ways too. They're different in patronage. Um, there are monuments in the North where women were significant in the fundraising process, but not at the same as the South. In the South, that becomes a real trope. That's a, that's a, a key feature of Confederate monuments, this idea that women and, you know, cohering in the United Daughters of the Confederacy, that women are the sponsors of these monuments. Mm -hmm. um, that's much more powerful in the South than in the North. Um, the kinds of spaces they're in are a little bit different. Um, not so different between um, the South and the Midwest, perhaps, but between the South and New England. Um, in New England, you know, you got the town common that is an important part of the rise of the monument. In the South, a lot of these monuments, um, they proliferate in conjunction with the growth of courthouse squares, um, you know, the rise of Southern courthouses. There are not a lot of freestanding courthouses in the South before the Civil War. The courthouse is a, is a product of the, you know, expanding and urbanizing New South and the monuments are gonna be there. That is mm -hmm. that is different from New England, right? So, um, you know, the budgets tend to be different. Um, you know, there, there are artists who specialize in each side, although there are also significant artists who will go back and forth. Um, so what there's about, an interesting dialogue there. Well, and, and the inscriptions on both sides have a kind of different flavor to them, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, a fundamental feature of these monuments is like, you know, justify these deaths. Yeah. Um, you know, what was this about? And, and so for the Confederacy, that's a real burden, right? I mean, they lost. So the, there's, a, um, uh, there's an argumentativeness about the inscriptions on the Southern monuments that is much more keyed up than the Union monuments, right? They, they, their burden of, of proof is a lot higher, you know, that, that this was worthwhile. We, uh, Jamie's let me know that some people want to see pictures. We, we did line up some, some pictures, uh, in particular, um, not of all these monuments that would have been too hard to pull off, but we do, um, I, I mentioned earlier, we were going to talk about Lincoln, uh, given that this is for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library <laughs> Foundation. Um, Lincoln is one of these leaders then who becomes part of this tradition and who occupies his own kind of space in it. So I, we, uh, Dr. Brown did bring some pictures uh, to talk a little about Lincoln Monument. So let's, uh, let's dive into Lincoln. Okay, let me um, share screen here. Oops. So, um, so far as Lincoln, um, I'd, I'd say there are basically three stages to keep in mind in, in terms of Lincoln Monument. Before you could talk about the stages, um, start with the importance. Um, Lincoln is a guy um, who died in the most dramatic way possible um, at exactly a moment when monuments were a really important part of his legacy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you know, there were no monuments in the United States, we'd still remember Abraham Lincoln. Um, but they play, if you think about, you know, how has Link, memory of Lincoln been shaped, um, monuments are a bigger part of that answer for him than, than for some other figures of comparable stature. Let's say Franklin D. Roosevelt, right? Franklin D. Roosevelt died, again, at the end of an extremely important war, um, at a period when the monument was a dead cultural form. And there are very few monuments to FDR. There was this, you know, kind of high profile um, effort finally to put one up, um, you know, half century after his death. But monuments have played very little part in remembrance of FDR. Whereas they're very important in the remembrance of Lincoln because the, the you know, 75 years after Lincoln's death are the heyday of the monument. 
So the first part of that, so there's a big flurry to build Lincoln monuments after he died, which is not just about the dramatic way he died, but it's a good index of the proliferation of monuments. Um, and there in this first um, 15 years, um, there's basically two um, uh, intersecting um, lines. One line is remembrance of Lincoln. The other line is remembrance of emancipation. Um, that was what Lincoln was remembered for. Um, it's possible to remember emancipation in other ways. It's, that's not the only important thing about it, that Lincoln did it. It's important to, you know, it could be remembered in other ways. But in terms of remembering Lincoln, at first it's all about emancipation. So this one is a good example. I mean, today we would never think of this as the kind of thing you put in a statue, somebody signing a document, no matter how important. But, um, but sure, this Randolph Rogers, very important sculptor of the time. Here is Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation. The second stage, so that kind of plays out, um, as I say, after about, um, after the, the um, Emancipation Memorial in Washington that has been so controversial in the past year. Right, that is like the end of that story. Um, and that's reproduced in Boston a few years later. And that's really the end of the first phase. And when after that reproduction in Boston, there's really only one Lincoln monument put up in the country um, for a while. And that's this one, which was, um, as I say, sort of a stage in itself. Um, it's the only one of the 80s and um, early 90s, and there's hardly any in the late 70s. Um, it, is, it is not the product of any kind of mass movement as some of the emancipation ones were. Um, it's, it's funded by a single person. And, um, but it's a great statue. It, is, it, is, it becomes um, one of the most highly regarded works of American art of any kind. Um, and the, the standard history of American sculpture that comes out in 1903, this is the frontispiece, right? This is like, this is our best thing. So um, a tremendously important monument that I, I discuss in the context of statues of orders. And we, we can come back to that if you want, but let me just, hit like what is the third stage. And the third stage is this militarization theme that is central to the book. Um, and Lincoln is in that too. Lincoln, um, when Lincoln monuments begin to uh, proliferate again around 1900, they are largely about envisioning him as uh, part of this military team, um, as a military commander. So here's a statue in Manchester, New Hampshire, that the GAR raised money for um, that is based on this John Rogers group. Um, here's a, a statue of, of Lincoln in um, East Orange, New Jersey, that shows Lincoln in this kind of military cape. You know, this again is in the kind of the vein of reviewing the troops, right? So this is the sort of military model and there are other examples of that. Um, so the big kind of dramatic, the, in some ways the climax of the book is that you've got this, this military version of Lincoln coming along um, and how does it um, fit with the Lincoln Memorial? Yeah. Um, and the answer is um, the, the people who are behind the mall in Washington, um, they're all about that military idea. Um, so here's the mall, right? Here's the Capitol building, here's the White House, um, here's the Washington Monument. Here's what. Here's the Lincoln Memorial. You know this bridge is going to lead to Arlington National Cemetery. When the Senate Park Commission was laying out this plan, their idea was this should be the memorial to Grant. Congress had already funded the memorial to Grant. It made sense to connect Grant to the troops he commanded, and what we could have. What they, were, they wanted there was like a triumphal arch you know, a, a military form, something like the Arc de Triomphe um, in Paris that would be, you know, like here, it'd be a big traffic circle, obviously, and it is a big traffic circle. Um, and it would be a screen that would be like an open door between Washington and the Arlington Cemetery, even if it's at an angle. But the people behind the Grant Memorial, the Grant Memorial had already been, fun been funded. They, they were glad to put it here. They'd say, sure, put it there but we don't want an arch. We want a horse. We want Grant on a horse. And so the people behind the Senate Park Commission said, all right, well, we'll put your horse 
well, put your horse here in front of the Capitol. And that's how Lincoln got this spot. Um, and the question became, how military was it gonna be? Was it gonna be same kind of thing, a, a triumphal arch with uh, just Lincoln's name on it instead of Grant's? Or was it gonna be something different? Um, and my argument is it wound up being something profoundly different. Um, the Lincoln Memorial is not especially militaristic because that was not particularly the, um, the interest of Daniel Chester French and Henry Bacon. Um, and their interest is, I think, well revealed by this monument they built right around the time, um, which they did together, right around the time um, Bacon got the commission for the Lincoln Memorial. You know, it's all about Lincoln's proximity to the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln as an orator, Lincoln yeah. as an intellectual. Um, it's based on a Greek statue of, of, of Demosthenes. You know, Lincoln's all buttoned up here. It's about what's inside there, you know. Um, it is not, you know, Lincoln commanding the troops, um, which is what, you know, kind of the Brandenburg Gate at the end of the mall would have been. And, and the Lincoln Memorial itself, then, the front is also very much emphasizes union, right? It's got the names of the states all around it, you know, that, that, that that's a, you know, that's the cause that's emphasized uh, as well there, too, right? It's, it's a, it's it, it is, it is union. It's very, it's very forward looking. Yes. Right. Um, you know, so many of these monuments, they they literally depict a very specific moment or they depict, you know, like, a, you know, this is kind of an imagined whatever Lincoln during the war kind of thing um, or, you know, Lincoln giving a speech kind of thing. But the Lincoln Memorial is not intended to be, you know, here's Abe, you know, at work. It is kind of like he lives with us today and we can go talk to him as Jimmy Stewart does in Mr. Smith Goes right. to Washington. Right. And, and that's totally what it was built for. It was yeah. built for that scene. Um, you know, it imagines, that's what it kind of imagines all of us doing, is going into Lincoln and saying, well, gee, what should we do? Um, so it is, as I say, it's forward looking. We're, we're getting a ton of questions. So I just want to squeeze in two more for you. One, especially because a lot of the people, or if not all the people who are watching us right now, probably uh, either are from near here or have been here. <laughs> And um, the Lincoln tomb really fits in this narrative as well. So yeah, can you talk a little bit about the Lincoln tomb and, and how it uh, handles Lincoln? That's a good point. I, I, I should have um, brought a picture of Lincoln too. But as you say, many, many people will be able to picture in their minds. The Lincoln tomb um, is, a, is um, a variation on a, a form that rather quickly established itself as the form for major cities. Major cities that had enough money, they didn't, you know, they wanted more than a single soldier. What they built was um, usually a pillar um, with uh, on top, like an allegorical figure of victory or America or something like that. And then around the bottom, there'd be soldiers from the artillery, the cavalry, the infantry, and then like name one other, you know, one other figure or whatever, or a, or a sailor often, something like that. Um, and the Lincoln tomb is kind of like that, right? It's got these, it's got the tower. It's, you know, it's not, um, Lincoln's not on top of it. He's in front of it, but it's got these groups, right? It's got the, um, the, the military groups on either side of him. Um, so that is, um, the tomb is a good example of how um, the steam was running out of the um, Lincoln um, as something different from a military figure. Um, you know, the early ones, the, the emancipation idea, um, those are not necessarily about Lincoln as a military leader. It's about Lincoln as a political leader in many ways. Um, but by the, the tomb kind of foreshadows what will emerge in the 1890s, right? Lincoln in the military context. And when they dedicated the tomb, they had um, like the army um, of the Tennessee had its reunion and turned out a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and that was... Um, as I say, it's kind of the commander in chief motif. Yeah, we have a, a, there's a few things in the collection I wanted to point out too. You, you, you showed the Council of War there. We have Robert Todd Lincoln's um, personal copy of that in our collection. Um, cool. They sent him a mold of it, he kept it on his desk. And then you mentioned the, the Army of the Tennessee is having their reunion. Sherman left a, a basket of flowers. Um, at the Lincoln tomb. And we still have that basket with the dried up flowers uh, oh, in fantastic. it, which is one of my favorite items. Yeah, it's one of those things we have. You know, everybody knows we have the Gaysburg address and stuff. But I love to show that item because it really shows that personal connection, you know, that Sherman went and laid that there and then we kept it, right? Oh, um, that's really cool, yeah. 
That's yeah. Uh, all right. Last question. Some of those same for me anyway, and then I'll then I really want to dive into these quite the the some of those same same tensions you just described with the Lincoln Tomb and then with the issues with the Lincoln Memorial all also come to play in the Grant Memorial and the Grant Memorial is a, is something very few people even know is in Washington or think to go see. So can we just real quickly, I know you brought a picture of it, talk about Grant in Washington. So the Grant well. Memorial, which is right um, here, right in front of the United States Capitol, is a is somewhat a hard um, thing to get a good picture of. It's enormous um, right. all the way across. Um, it, is, it is in some ways too a variation on like the Lincoln tomb, right? This formula that shows you know, the central figure, Grant on a horse. Um, the, the infantry here is on this, this frieze, this panel below him. And then there's one great big action group dedicated to the artillery and one great big action group dedicated to the um, cavalry. And these action groups are a good example of, as I was saying, soldier um, monuments, especially ones with substantial budgets, become a lot, um, they have more figures in them. They become about action. You, you see people dying in them. Um, you know, they're, they're these kind of like scenes of war. Um, and the Grant Monument is a, is, is a perfect example of that. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things about the Grant Memorial. Um, one is that it, um, it was developed by artists um, who had considerable military experience. Uh, they were both served in the 7th Regiment in New York. Um, Henry Schrady's father um, treated Grant before he died. Uh, Casey's father um, was a high level War Department official. Uh, and he, was, um, he knew a lot about the military idea. And the big idea that is coming along in um, military thinking at the time that Grant Memorial is chosen is the idea of the chief of staff. Um, the idea that um, unlike the Civil War, where we're just gonna to react to the situation and put it together on the, on the fly, that th there has to be permanent planning, permanent looking ahead, a staff of people who are always ready for the next war, that war is something that you, you, know, you, don't, you don't take a break from, even if it's not going on actively. Um, and that's a, that's a huge event in the professionalization of the American army. Um, and this monument is very much in tune with that. Right, the vision of Grant is he sure is not leading the troops into, you know, into battle. He's sure not fighting from the front. He, you know, he's this kind of problem solver, um, who's who's back there thinking. Um, he's not reviewing anybody, although it was actually built to be. Um, and when they had the design competition, it wasn't decided that Grant was going to be here. Um, there was an idea floating around for um, this space that, um, that we come to know as the ellipse would be a parade ground. That's what the army was pushing for, would be a parade ground. And um, uh, Sherman would go here, Sheridan here, and Grant here, right in front of the White House. And they, the three of them would be reviewing the troops. And the president would stand here on this, and this is what it was built for, would stand here when he reviewed the troops. When they that meaning that lost all meaning when they put it in front of the Capitol and you know and they didn't build the parade ground right, um, but anyhow that, that that is an example of the the ways in which you know things uh, the the development of these monuments is related to ideas about the military and the presence of the military in American public life. Yeah, and I, I'm I'll uh, I'll. Uh... This is, you know, really, you know, I'm, I'm really fascinated by civil monuments. I'm also just fascinated by the National Mall and all the different issues and, and symbols going on in that space. But yeah, I, I definitely want to get to some of these questions folks are asking us. Um, and I, I know a number of you are asking, I'm very aware about cur the current issue of these monuments and the current debate going on about it. And I will absolutely get to that. I will we'll close on those issues. But let's get to a couple things first before we, we jump into the 21st century. Um, one of the questions we got um, was who is paying for a lot of these monuments? You know, are they public funds, private funds, government agencies? How are these monuments getting paid for? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, well, the, the answer is there are thousands of these monuments, right? Thousands. And um, together, they demonstrate pretty much every permutation you can imagine. 
right? The Lincoln statue in Chicago is paid for by a single guy who leaves the money in his will, right? The um, uh, Grant statue here is paid for by Congress, $250,000 in 1902. Um, in a Lincoln Memorial, obviously paid for by Congress. Some other ones are um, paid for by public fundraising. So you've got um, a lot of different um, a lot of different approaches. There's no single answer to that question. There's a lot of different approaches. Right. Um, I think I, if you I, if you wanted to, I guess if you wanted to take a, a takeaway from it, it would be that compared to today where even you know, very high uh, budget memorials, it is assumed that a lot of money is gonna come from private fundraising, particularly from the, um, you know, a lot of the corporate fundraising. Um, the idea that the federal government you know, spent $250,000 for this monument, you know, $75,000 for Sherman, you know, 50,000 for Sheridan and so on, that those are, those are federally funded projects. Um, and that, that is a, a kind of high watermark for actual government spending on public monuments. Um, I'm sure you get this question a lot and uh, you can answer pretty quickly. We got the, uh, the, stand, the question that everybody always wants to ask in these scenarios, the, uh, the myth about horses, four horses. legs. The, the four legs, yes. Right. I, um, yes, well, I, I uh, grew up in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And so I learned this story very early. Um, and the story is essentially that um, you can tell by how many legs the horse has in the air what the fate of the general was. Um, and that, you know, if he had, um, I can't remember exactly which direction it works in, but I think if it was, he had four on the ground, he, he lived, yeah. um, you know, two in the air, he died, and, you know, one up, he was wounded. Um, what, that is a fascinating, fascinating urban legend. Um, it's completely untrue. Um, you can find, you know, different monuments to Robert E. Lee, for example, that, you know, have different poses. Um, and, um, you know, it does not track what the actual experience of, of people who died in, in any, any systematic way. Um, it is interesting that it emerged. It, um, there's, a, there's a file of letters in the National Archives of people who have written to the uh, written to the federal government to ask this question, um, mm. and wow. uh, the first of those letters is from the early 1920s, and um, it is it is an example of how these monuments. I guess I would say it's an example of how people shape the meaning of the monuments and found something you know kind of magical about them. Right there was this hidden code. There was this mis mystery about them. Um, that was one way of kind of testifying to their power, I think. Um, let's, uh, let's talk really briefly too about um, the Af uh, African-American um, tradition in Civil War monuments as well. Um, do not get they do not get represented in a lot of monuments. Remember they oh. make up about 10% of the Union Army. Um, you know, they make up a, a small, small part of 1% of Union soldiers represented in, um, you know, Civil War monuments. Uh, on the other hand, they are um, the, the subject of, of um, I think most people say kind of the artistically the most distinguished of these monuments, the Shaw Memorial in Boston. Um, and that that is a huge story in itself, the Shaw Memorial. Yeah. Um, there are uh, a couple other monuments of interest um, that feature African Americans only a couple um, from this time period. One in uh, Norfolk, um, uh, there's one in uh, Missouri, one in North Carolina, uh, but there's only a couple from the turn of the century. Um, there are a couple figures. There's a figure, there, you know, they, they have these multi-figure monuments. The, the monument in Cleveland, for example, has many, many figures on it. Um, I'm sorry, Indianapolis, Indianapolis, a very high profile oh, yeah. figure of African-American um, on that one. Um, but they're, they're not a lot. They're not a lot. Um, which is, which falls in line generally with civil war memory and, and the way the African-American experience. And, and I should say, right so in this, in, you know, when I was talking about the first stage of the Lincoln, um, you know, commemoration, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I was saying, you know, there are alternative ways to remember Lincoln, uh, not remember Lincoln, alternative ways to remember emancipation 
The kind of high profile way that did not happen was a statue cycle that would have traced, you know, African Americans from slavery to, um, you know, from like the, there's a, um, there was a design for um, the National Freedmen's Memorial, the one that was funded by African Americans yeah. after the war that becomes the, the monument in Washington that everybody knows of Lincoln and the, the you know, the rising uh, slave. Right. Um, the, uh, the initial design for that showed, you know, Lincoln's uh, coffin on top. And uh, so, you know, you don't see Lincoln except in lying, lying down. Um, and beneath it, a cycle that showed um, a, a slave on the auction block, a slave in the fields, a contraband um, in the war, and a sol black soldier in uniform. And that would have been much more of a, a monument about the making of black citizenship. Um, but that monument wasn't built. Instead, we got the Emancipation Memorial we have. It's been a long time since I was there. And I know you don't really talk as much about um, battlefield monuments, but isn't the the contraband monument, I want to say it's in Corinth, isn't it like that? Isn't it a cycle? I've been so long since I was there. Oh, oh you, 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 you totally... You totally stumped the band. Okay. Um, you totally stumped the band. I did. I started out the book saying I'm not going to deal with battlefield parks. Yeah. But I I came um, to realize as I was working on the book that um, the battlefield parks are really important because the designs that that become popular in battlefield parks begin yeah. to influence cities. Um, and so I was scrambling to learn about battlefield parks, um, but I haven't learned about that one. Well, and that's a whole different story, too. I mean, if there's a whole different narrative about the way these battlefield parks are commemorated and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole other book. But although, um, yes, I, I do think it is. It's a different kind yeah. of environment. And that Let's, monument, I don't know how old that monument would be. That doesn't seem it's not like very old. It, you know, it went up, oh. I want to say, 21st century, maybe like just before. Yeah. Yes. It's well, monuments to African-American soldiers have been a, a boom field since yes. since the movie Glory came out. Yes. Since the movie Glory came out, you could find, you know, 20 of them easily um all right let's uh uh let's start wading into the politics both then and now we, we had a couple questions that were very similar i'm going to try to combine them both together which is that a um a comment that's frequently made in the current debate over monuments um is about the racial politics of these monuments especially in the south this idea that these monuments are going up as a signal to the african-american community in uh the south that they are you know they are not part of the body politic that you know they are they are something other um can you can you speak to that intent you know was that intent real uh you know that that whole issue yeah i mean well um no question um no question i i think um a good way to to conceptualize it is is we we're just talking about the monument on the courthouse square you know the court these these courthouses in new south communities you know that's where public life happened not just you know where you know courtroom proceedings happened that's where politics was done right. that's where voting took place that was unquestionably the site of authority in uh in these southern communities and putting the confederate um soldier there was a way of signaling um who's in charge um, which is could be independent, um, different from the processes of law. And so, you know, that's definitely a signal to you, African-American citizen, that you may have these rights in the law books, but, you know, the, the power here is uh, the Confederate soldier, um, not necessarily paid for by voters. Um, you know, the votes are not because, you know, they're sponsored often by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, but they're sponsored by the white elite. Um, and it's it's a signal that the white elite, the the class and racial structure of power of the of the South is more important than the legal structure. So yeah, no no question, they're they're sending a signal of that sort. Right. If you're a if you're an African American in one of those communities and you have any business at the courthouse, you have to walk past an armed Confederate soldier to get there, right? I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's pretty clear message. Um, yeah, it's pretty clear what he's standing there for. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then but although. Although I should say, you know, they were also, I mean, th that was an audience, but it was not the only audience. Right. That's right? not the only reason. I mean, it right. was also intended to inspire the white community right. um, and unify the white community. I mean, the, the post-war white South is not a monolith by any means. 
there's a lot of class tensions, um, especially in industrializing communities. Um, and um, it, so it was, it was not just about suppressing the Black South. It was also an attempt to kind of unify the White South. Well, and, and you know, and again, it, and those are up. pieces of art, public or otherwise, you know, in public, in public spaces or otherwise are, have multiple meanings. And, and they are, in fact, you know, the other thing to remember about those monuments, of course, of the soldiers, they are also intended to memorialize these soldiers, right? Like, they, you know, they're not, they're not cloak and dagger operations either, but it's important to understand that there's multiple things going on. And, and, and that placement, I think that the point you make is placement is very important, right? They didn't put it in the cemetery. They put yeah, it I, in I, front I, of the courthouse, right? Yeah, my, in my experience of these things, you know, there's a number of things to look at. You know, there's, the, there's like who started it, who paid for it, yeah. what's the design? Where did they put it? What was the dedication event like? Um, so often, where they put it is really um, the most revealing of those various things. And, and so let's talk about the North then too. So in the North, um, I have a similar question about the politics, both then and now, of Northern monuments. Is there a political element to where they're going, what they're doing, um, you know, and how they've evolved over time? Absolutely. And, and if you'd asked somebody, you know, in 1905, you know, is there a racial element, they'd say sure, because their idea of race would have included these new immigrant groups. And again, it is about modeling an idea of whiteness um, and um, trying to, you know, um, suppress um, the, all, all, what they saw as the alternatives, which were um, Southern and Eastern European immigrants. Um, as in the South, a lot of it is about class divisions um, as much as ethnic and racial divisions. Um, it, these, these visions of the new, um, new commander visions we're talking about, they're very tied to industrial capitalism, right? The phrase captains of industry becomes uh, you know, an important phrase and it, you know, it signals this relationship between um, kind of military leadership and, and economic leadership, corporate leadership. And a number of um, financial titans basically have themselves portrayed in equestrian statues. Yeah. You know, it's like kind of showing themselves as military figures, practically. Well, and to show how embedded these memorials become in the landscape is, you know, the, the Monument Avenue story, right? That Monument Avenue, which is obviously one of the most contested spaces right now, the reason that uh, uh, some, if not all, those monuments are put there is to encourage um, residential development along uh, along that area, right? Absolutely, it was intended to be kind of an upscale. Uh, it and it became eventually. It took a yeah. little while, but it became an upscale residential neighborhood. Right. So these yeah. monuments are also driving, <laughs> uh, yes. you know, development yes. and modernization as well. Right? They're not just yes. representing it. And that's true uh, in Washington, also. You know, yeah, the, the it is. It's right. like. Uh, um, DuPont Circle and um, Thomas, um, things like that. There, you know, those are very much intended to develop um, communities, neighborhoods. Yeah, and you said you grew up there, and I, I lived there for a little while. And you know, the if you're not versed on your Civil War generals, too, I mean, those equestrian statues, they all run together. I mean, with the exception <laughs> of Mead, and you talk about Mead a little bit, and I don't, you know, what a what a, he has a real kind of odd monument compared to the others, but the, you know, there's these equestrian guys are in every one of these, um, you know, circles all over town. Right? Yes. There's tons of them. Tons of them. Um, well then let's talk about the, the debate going on right now. We got a lot of questions from folks about, um, you know, your, your thoughts on these being torn down. Should they be torn down? What should we do with them once they're torn down? You know, all, all these questions that are floating around right now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to throw it to you as just kind of a, a, a big, a big general question of, you know, how, how do you feel about the current debate on these monuments and their fate? Well, you know, as, as someone, I've been working on this stuff for uh, a long time, um, mm -hmm. longer than it should have taken me, I suppose. But, um, you know, it's exciting to see people excited about them. Um, you know, I've been interested in them for a long time, but now they're the subject of, of public engagement. Um, and that's, um, that's great. Um, I think the public engagement, the, the fact that the public engagement that some communities have chosen is to take down the monument, um, I also think is great. Um, I wrote, uh, one of the first things I did on this topic was a long piece about the Calhoun Monument in Charleston, 
um, back in the mid '90s, and you know it came down this past summer. Um, it's a, a real opportunity for Charleston to um, reshape its one of its major public spaces um, and kind of redefine itself as a city. Um, I think that's true of Monument Avenue. Um, a great opportunity for Richmond to redefine itself as a city. Um, you know, people who are interested in studying them, we study dead, dead people all the time. Yeah. Um, and studying dead monuments, um, you know, we could still do that. You can study monuments that have gone down. Um, but you can't, you know, you, you have to live with the ones that are up. And I have no problem with the communities that have chosen that they don't want to live with these monuments anymore. It seems perfectly reasonable. But I'm, I'm very pleased that it's a community by community decision. Um, yeah. And other communities have chosen other things. Um, I do think there, there have been some interesting attempts to kind of leverage the monuments, you might say, rather than eliminate them, you know, kind of put something next to it that, that sort of comments on it, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's, for, it's, it's great that communities are having the debates. Well, and as we emphasized before, context matters too. You know, when, when I, I've also been involved in programs and discussions where this question, you know, this question comes up obviously a lot, I'm sure for you more than me, but you know, the, the, when you say case by case, you know, that having a blanket solution for all these is, is ignores a lot of what's going, it's where the monument is, what it's depicting, what the community currently looks like, you know, there, there's no so, one size fits all these communities need to sort these things out themselves and you know that's what memorials are they're ways of of expressing of a community expressing its ideals right and yes um, I, I, in in this case i really think the process is is what's important you know on yeah. a com to happen on a community basis not that so much that i think that the debates will be that different or the or that i think the outcome necessarily you know if you asked me to to decide about all of them, the outcome would be that different but you need to have that community process because the monument's an inherently local thing. It's only right. in one place. You've got to, and so it's a chance for that place to, you know, define itself. That's, that I think is the big problem with these um, statutes that essentially try to limit or eliminate municipal control over their own public landscape. You know, the monuments to the, in, the, in the South and, you know, here in South Carolina, for example, they were monuments to the Confederacy and monuments to the community. They were both of those things very much. Yeah. And to say that they're only monuments to the Confederacy that the community can't control is basically to, to like take away one meaning and to say that you know they're only they're only this. They're no longer about the community. And that I think is is not right. What um, this will be the last question because we are running out of time. I don't keep much longer. I, I again really appreciate this discussion. The the uh, the other question that comes up a lot then is these ones that do get torn down. You know what do you do with them? And so this idea they should all be put in a museum or we should relocate them to some other area where they have less context or you know or at or more context or whatever. You know what what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a tough one. That that's a really I interesting know. question. Um, because I know a lot of museum professionals are not keen on them. Right. Um, I know um, on taking them, I know, um, I, I think one of the most interesting um, twists in this uh, debate has been, you know, extending it into the battlefield parks, where mm -hmm. I think, you know, before they were seen, you know, the battlefield park ones were seen more as illustrations, you might say, mm -hmm. you know, of the of a narrative, you know, embellishments rather than celebrations, you know. Right. Um, but now th there's a lot of um, question about having in the battlefield parks. Um, I, I do think that they um, personally, I think in terms of going into a museum, that they could serve a real purpose. That it is important to educate, um, you know, future generations of America about the, you know, racial heritage of the United States and what the right. what the racial history is. It hasn't always been pretty. In fact, it's often been pretty ugly. But, um, but it, it's, that is a way in which they are history, right? People say they're history in the sense that, you know, it, it's history to keep, um, you know, Robert E. Lee and the landscape. Yeah, what's more history in some ways is that, you know, Richmond put this five-story statue of Robert E. Lee right. up in 1890. That's the history. Right. Um, and to, to, you know, for, to, to not teach that history, I think, would be a mistake. Yeah, you know, the, the history of, of race in America. Right. 
um, yeah, the only the only thing I'll add to that is is yeah, because I get that question a lot too. And and as a museum professional, one of the things that most people don't know about museums is we don't have a lot of space. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, right. that's always you know. Well, I agree. It would be really cool. You know, like I know one of the debates, and and I, I don't know anybody in this fight. So I let me be clear. I, I, I don't know what the status is, but I know one of the arguments with Monument Avenue they're making is that the Museum of the American Civil War should take all those monuments. And, you know, that, that museum does not have a very big footprint. So I don't know where those monuments would go, you know? And so it's, sure. it's a, like you said, it's a, it's, and I don't mean to be dismissive. It's an interesting question and you're absolutely right. There's all kinds of, as a museum professional, I love doing interpretation on these kinds of items but you know it's it's a tricky thing to you know physically where can you put them and then how can you interpret them in a space so um i can imagine yeah They're we're big. still we're going to be arguing about this for a long time but um anyway uh i really want to thank you for this this was um this was really wonderful i was i was really glad we uh you could come on and we could talk about especially this issue since it's one so many people are interested in thanks to all you for 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 watching and for your questions i'm i know i didn't get to all your questions i i think i covered most of the bases though so um, well thanks so, so much for having me on and if you're you know listeners have questions that you didn't get a chance to get to and they want to shoot me an email then they're welcome to do that all right. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. He's at the University of South Carolina. You can um, find him on their uh, faculty page. So uh, thank you very much, Tom. This was great. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Jane. Thank you guys very much for the conversation. Um, I could keep listening for hours. And like Christian said, um, such an interesting conversation and super timely um, and one that we all have a lot of questions on. And many comments come in and said, thank you for a different perspective. And they really liked learning everyone else's opinion on that. So again, thanks for that. Um, I know I speak for everyone. It was super educational. I learned a lot and our members just really continue to love the insight that they're getting from these programs. So we again, thank you so much. This will be recorded and we will share it on our YouTube page um, tomorrow and we'll send everyone out a link. We can also include um, Dr. Brown's email address in there should you have any follow-up questions. We certainly encourage you to go and purchase his book if you have not already. Um, please do that at your local bookstore or wherever books are, wherever you purchase your books. So please do that. Um, and we also want you to encourage you to share this link with other people. Um, it, it, it encourages our future historians as well as encourages other people to become members so that they can get this exclusive benefit. Um, wanna make sure we, that we tell you about some future programming that we have in the next couple of months. Next week, um, November 17th, we have Pat Davis. She will be portraying Sojourner Truth. And then December 7th, Christian will be back with us with Jason Emerson. Um, with the, he is the author of the book, Mary Lincoln for the Ages. That one will also be very popular. Um, and then December 15th, we will have Bob Davis and he will be portraying Frederick Douglass. So again, tune in for all of those. Christian is very busy um, planning into January and February as well. So we appreciate that. And we look forward to offering you guys much more throughout um, as we go along. So as we close out the webinar tonight, uh, there will always be a short survey. I encourage you to take that. That does help us to um, improve our offerings as well as gives us ideas for future offerings. So please take that. It takes less than a few, few less than a couple of minutes for sure. So, and we would also just be appreciative of any contribution, big or small. So you can go to our website, www.alplm.org. Um, that just helps us to continue our efforts of carrying on Mr. Lincoln's legacy. So again, gentlemen, thank you so much. And we appreciate everyone for joining us tonight and have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>